Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 68 of Compliance Into the Weeds, the only compliance podcast that takes a deep dive, literally going into the weeds of a compliance or compliance-related topic. I'm joined, as always, by my colleague, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance. Today, we take up the topic of regulatory review and repeal of regulations by the Trump administration. It is not clear whether this is going to be a guillotine, a la the French Revolution, whether this is simply waiting for Godot, or perhaps even Candyland in its approach. Nevertheless, Matt and I take a deep dive into the Trump administration's attempt to allegedly cut back on regulations and sub-regulatory guidance. We explore it Uh, in terms of the FCPA and what it might mean for the compliance practitioner and certainly businesses and what it would have meant had this occurred earlier point in time. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back again for another episode of Compliance Into the Weeds, where with my colleague and brother-in-arms, Matt Kelly, founder and editor of Radical Compliance, we take a deep dive into a compliance or compliance-related topic, literally going into the weeds to geek out and give you a really in-depth look at something. Today, we take a look at a topic that Matt has blogged about this week. His blog post is entitled, Regulatory Czar Eyes Agency Guidance. And Matt, I really had visions of um, Robespierre in the guillotine after reading your uh, your piece. So uh, why don't you uh, lay the uh, groundwork, and then we can see where we can take this. Yeah, sure. Hey, Tom, it's good to be here as always. Um, this was a speech given last week by a woman named Naomi Rao, and she is the Trump administration's head of the office. For Information and Regulatory Affairs. Uh, Apparently, this is known as OIRA, if you live within the Beltway and you think about these agency nicknames. Um, So Naomi Rao gave a speech last week at the Brookings Institution, one of these Washington think tanks, looking at the first year of the deregulatory agenda in Washington. And OIRA is the agency tasked with reviewing regulations that other agencies put out to make sure that they are necessary, that they uh, that the benefits of them outweigh the costs, that they are not duplicative. And in Rao's case, she now clearly has a marching order from President Trump that he wants to deregulate as much as he can find. Um, as you might remember back, I want to say in February of last year, he published that executive order saying that for every new rule an agency puts forth, an agency must propose eliminating two other rules. Uh, so Rao talked about that and how that has worked in the first year, what she wants to do in 2018. And she did say some pretty interesting things about what she would like to do that could possibly affect compliance officers who rely on government agency guidance and rules uh, for a living and to know what you're supposed to do. Uh, So the speeches are on YouTube. I have links to them on my blog post. She gave a lot of time. She prepared remarks for about 25 minutes and then Q&A with the audience for another 50. So I do appreciate that Ms. Rao tried to say a lot. Um, that said, I remain unconvinced that um, you know this really is the big sort of deregulatory change compliance officers might have expected 14 months ago when President Trump first uh, took office and was elected. So I guess, Matt, other than a vision of Robespierre and perhaps Saint-Jean uh, on the guillotine, I did have another vision, which was waiting for Godot. And, uh, yeah. um, and this, the absurdity of this in terms of, well, did Ms. Rao violate her own prescription by talking about not giving guidance? Is that, in fact, guidance? And uh, You know, that's a fair point to ask. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll say, Tom, you know, you're talking about the guillotine. I think the better flawed metaphor for this is she talked about the gold scissors that President <laughs> Trump used at a photo op where he use these big oversized gold scissors to cut a metaphorical gold ribbon around a gigantic stack of regulations. I'm wondering if this is perhaps 
Were they gold-plated scissors, which would be very much in theme with President Trump personally and the Trump administration, flashy on the outside, kind of cheap and shabby stuff underneath when you really get to, does this make a difference? That, that's what my concern is. Well, so let me turn from, does it make a difference um, uh, to, is it something that is positive for the community? And I guess we can talk about the compliance community because one of the criticisms leveled at the DOJ from sort of circa 2007 to 2012 was people didn't know what was expected uh, of them uh, in terms of a compliance program. And certainly, you know, the DOJ made speeches, they put out enforcement actions, they gave opinion releases, uh, and then they came out with a 2012 guidance. And you cite to that in your blog post, I think, uh, properly. But is uh, if we don't have the guidance, uh, it would seem to me the business community would be up in arms because then we go back to, well, what are the rules? Yeah, and that's a very good point that I explore in my post. And there are we're at the moment, let's unravel two different issues that compliance officers want to keep in mind. First, let's talk about regulations, formal regulations that get proposed, they get out for public comment, they get revised, they get adopted and all of that. Um, and this two for one kill order that President Trump supposedly put out last year. Uh, I say supposedly because that executive order had so many holes that it looked like a piece of Swiss cheese on a practical basis for compliance officers. Um, it's not necessarily if it's good or bad, it's whether it's relevant. For example, any regulations relating to foreign affairs, national security, military, they're all exempt from this two-for-one kill order. So anti-money laundering rules pertain to national security, they're exempt. Um, you also you have to be very careful in the wording here that he didn't say for every rule an agency adopts, it must eliminate two. It said for every rule you propose to adopt, you must propose to eliminate two others. You don't actually have to eliminate them. You just have to propose that you would want to get rid of B and C when you propose A. Um, and then when you propose to eliminate it, you do go through the rigmarole of putting them out for public comment, getting feedback, all of this other fun stuff. And this two-for-one kill order does not apply to independent agencies as specified under federal law. So that means agencies such as Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, Internal Revenue Service, Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, they are all exempt. There are at least a dozen major in, uh, agencies in the federal government that don't have to pay attention to this at all. Their directors can strive for this if they so choose, and clearly some of them do. I would think of like Scott Pruitt at the EPA, who wants to kill every environmental rule he could find, but they don't have to. So for a lot of what compliance officers worry about, the two-for-one kill order doesn't really apply to them because those regulations that you worry about, they are still going to be here. Um, then, which, I mean, that was a point that, Naomi Rao kind of glossed over. She very gleefully announced that they have decelerated the creation of new guidance and they have delayed or withdrawn 1,500 proposed rules in the last 12 months. Great news if you like deregulation. However, she didn't actually say how many existing rules they had killed, which is much less. Uh, then, to your other point, Tom, she talked a lot about guidance and sub-regulatory guidance and how she would like to address that in 2018. So what is sub-regulatory guidance? It is anything, theoretically, it is anything that is not an actual regulation. So um, something like the FCPA guidance from 2012 that we all eat and breathe uh, in thinking about effective uh, corporate compliance programs. Something like perhaps a Dear CFO letter that the Securities and Exchange Commission likes to put out. Um, potentially, it could be a major policy speech that a uh, government official might give. Rao even defined what she would consider to be non-regulatory guidance or sub-regulatory guidance. Um, it is, how did you say it? Anything economically significant or otherwise significant from a policy perspective. She thinks that OIRA should be taking a look at that. Um, now, suddenly you get into a whole lot more of a gray area about how much is that 
a good or a bad idea for compliance officers. Can you imagine if we had to take the 10 hallmarks of an effective compliance program in that 2012 FCPA guidance, if we had to take that and put that out for public comment and feedback, if there had to be an exposure draft and then feedback and then you go back to the drawing board, um, would that be useful for compliance officers? Would it make sense? Would it be just a big golden opportunity for special interest to lean on the department to weaken what it believes a compliance program should look like. Now, maybe it should, because that was a big policy shift when that guidance came out. That's significant policy because we all live, live and breathe it. So what about something like the guidelines to evaluate the effectiveness of compliance programs? That's the stuff that came out just about one year ago that uh, the former compliance counsel, Wei Chen, had put out at the Justice Department. That wasn't intended for the public. It wasn't designed for them. It was designed as an internal Justice Department document that they posted on the website anyways. Um, so would that count as sub-regulatory guidance? Because a lot of us still read it. We think it's significant. How many legal bulletins have been put forth and showed up in compliance officers' email boxes because of it? Lots. But should that have been put out for public comment, too? I mean, that strikes me as no, that doesn't make sense. I, I don't know what would make sense here. Um, and I do think that independent agencies and a lot of government officials, frankly, who do give speeches and try to telegraph their needs, their desires, like, I don't know that they'd like that idea. So, um, you know, maybe the right analogy is the uh, the game Candyland. Uh, is, that, <laughs> is that a part of the... Uh, uh, Kelly household at this point? It, it is. My son, he's three, and he is an avid player of Candyland. He's not an avid player of a person of letting me have the turn, but he does grasp the idea that you can, you know, kind of go forth and, you know, kind of, it's, you make it up as you go along. Because it seems to me, Matt, if we were going to take this uh, in many different, or in several different directions, but one would be, even with Rod Rosenstein's announcement of the new corporate FCPA enforcement policy, that was a significant change in the law because uh, the Department of Justice, annou Justice announced the presumption would be for a declination now in the face of a criminal violation. Uh, now, that to get that presumption, you had to engage in, in certain activities, self-disclosure, profit disgorgement, remediation, and extensive cooperation. Nevertheless, uh, for the DOJ to announce uh, pre-review, we're going to give you a pass. That's a pretty big change. Uh, I, I would agree. I Actually, I would also note, you know, since we talk about the FCPA enforcement policy, um, a detail here that Attorney General Jeff Sessions, last November 16th, he put out a memo, which could be interpreted as guidance, but it was an internal Justice Department memo, uh, where he said that from now on, the the Justice Department would not issue any new sub-regulatory guidance along these lines, basically agreeing with Rao and her point. Um, that was on November 16. Thirteen days later, the FCPA enforcement policy comes out, which strikes me as a big shift in enforcement policy. However, all Ron Rosenstein did was frame it as it's not designed for the public. It's designed for prosecutors. Of course, if you are the public sitting across from a prosecutor, you're going to wonder what's going through their head anyways and want to read what they're reading. So it seemed almost to me like Rosenstein was doing an end run right around what Jeff Sessions and Naomi Rao wanted to put forth. Um, it's just I think we're going to see a lot of that, even if um, big agency leaders such as Jeff Sessions, Scott Pruitt at the EPA and others, you know, even if they really do go whole hog on ending sub-regulatory guidance, which I don't know that that's a useful idea, but even if they do, they're going to then wind up doing other things that essentially are, are guidance that we're going to read about. You know, I, I mean, anybody can take something as guidance. I, I assume everyone listening takes uh, my, my blog posts and your blog posts as, as guidance and gospel, Tom. It doesn't mean that it actually is. It's just how people perceive it. Well, they um, certainly take radical compliance that way. That, that's it's really is the point. You know, how do people perceive what is put out there? And, you know, not necessarily that anything is going to be declared sub-regulatory guidance. Um, 
Now, we're talking a lot about the Justice Department. Over at the SEC, I think they would probably have bigger concerns because they do churn out sub-regulatory guidance on a regular basis. I mean, we, we haven't seen a whole lot of it lately, but the dear CFO letters about how to address risks of climate change, risks of cybersecurity, they would qualify as sub-regulatory guidance. This new guidance that is supposedly coming out in 2018 about cybersecurity, a refreshed, more modern take on it. You know, I last I heard that was just going to be put out by the Division of Corporation Finance, no comment period included. But would the SEC now have to bow to um, Naomi Rao's uh, preferences here and actually put this out for public comment? Um, I am reminded that, you know, just, just because uh, the public is involved, it doesn't necessarily mean that the public knows what it's talking about or that we have good ideas. Sometimes you should trust the experts, and I think we can't lose sight of that fact in this, this whole debate. So I guess, Matt, I come down on the side of it is in the interest of the U.S. corporate community to have a better understanding of what the regulators believe corporate obligations are under their uh, the laws passed by Congress. And so I don't see this uh, as a positive for the corporate community. And uh, my sense would be that I understand the desire to cut back on regulations, but when you're cutting back on information that is useful for consumers, whether those are individuals such as ourselves or large uh, multinational corporations, I don't really view that as positive nor something that we consumers would benefit from. No, not necessarily. And, you know, so we might have a, a lack of guidance. Companies are going to make up more things as they go along. Uh, we will have some sort of a failure of some kind, and the consumers will be unhappy. The board will be unhappy. The board will be saying, how did we get into this? That's usually when the compliance officer gets called into the hot seat. You're right there with the general counsel and everybody else. Um, it's not a question of do we need more or less regulation. It is do we want smarter or dumber regulation. And what I think struck me most about Naomi Rao's speech is that throughout the whole 75 minutes she talked, she talked constantly about deregulation unto itself is a good that we should pursue whenever possible. And that is different than what we've heard her predecessors in the Obama administration talk about regulation. They were not necessarily in favor of lots more regulation or deregulation, but they were in favor of, does this regulation, does it act as a force amplifier to streamline conduct? And you know, one example that comes to my mind, Cass Sunstein held this job back in the first Obama term, I believe it was. And he wrote a book called Nudge about does regulation very quietly and minimally invasive does it nudge people to do much more? Something as dorky as where do you put the salad bar in a school cafeteria? If you put it at the beginning, students are more likely to eat salad rather than if you put it at the end and they've already stocked up on pizza and cake and Pringles. So that's why you would have a regulation as goofy and arcane as where does the salad bar go in a school cafeteria? And really think about it. The next time you're at a compliance conference and you line up for the buffet, What's the very first piece of food that you see? You encounter the salad. That certainly is the, seems to be the standard in all of the conferences I go to. It's the same kind of dynamic. This is a smart, pain-free regulation that will then get more bang for its buck. Um, it's not even a pain-free, but minimally less pain for whatever bang for your buck you're going to get. You know, If you're going to regulate that salad has to be served, you might as well say it put it here so that we can get the most bang out of regulating where the salad that people are going to be served salad in, in public schools. That kind of logic is valid. It's worth considering. And it was totally absent from what Rao was talking about in 2018. It's, you know, it's really, it's about smart regulation, not more or less. So I think uh, your comment that this policy is uh, devoid of not reality, but logic, I think, speaks to the entire administration uh, as it has governed over the past year. So uh, perhaps on yeah. that note, it might be an appropriate time to end, Matt. All right, Tom. 
Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and help get the word out about the only podcast that takes a deep dive, literally going into the weeds of a compliance or compliance-related topic each week. Also, if you have any questions, you can email Matt at mkelly at radicalcompliance.com. You can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. If you're going to be at the SCCE Utilities and Energy Conference next week in Washington, D.C. I hope you'll stop by and say hello. I'd love to get your thoughts on this podcast or any of the other podcasts in the Compliance Podcast Network. Thank you again for listening to this episode of Compliance Into the Weeds. Compliance Into the Weeds is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network.